All right, good morning, everybody. You know, I want to welcome all of you for being here today. This is a really good turnout. Uh, my name is Thor Waspotten. I'm the director of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at Kent State University. And I want to welcome you on this beautiful September day. <laughs> I thought I'd get a little bit of a laugh out of that. Listen, um, you want to kind of start a day like today with a little bit of levity. And the reason is, is because what you're going to be talking about today is so darn serious and so important. You know, when we look at what's happening in scholastic journalism and journalism across this country, there really is, there are very few more important issues to protecting democracy and enhancing democracy as we move forward. And with what you've done over the past, however long your career has been in this, in this charge that you've had as, as, as a person, it's only going to get more important. And so I want to thank you for being here to go through this. Our Center for Scholastic Journalism, as you know, is the country's leader in helping us understand the importance of, of journalism and journalism education, scholastic journalism within, within high schools, and actually even, even uh, earlier than that, right? As students start understanding through their parents, through community sources, what is fact, what's fiction, what's truth, what's not, this is critically important, the things that you're doing. I was going to mention two quick things. Uh, one is on Monday, I'll be meeting with the Hudson School District and the Hudson City Manager as we talk about journalism, the community in which I live, on how to be able to teach it, how to be able to promote uh, democracy and freedom of the press. And I think it's going to be a really interesting opportunity as they're trying to bring in our, our school potentially as to helping with that and helping with that charge. The second thing is, is that we're talking about this as deans and directors of schools of journalism and mass communication across this country. In February, uh, we're having our ASJMC, Association of Schools of Journalism and Mass Communication, workshop in Memphis, Tennessee. And what we're looking at is how we can teach journalism, especially after this election, and how we can help the students that have come to us and have come to me in the past week and a half to say, I'm thinking of changing my major because I don't know how I can go into this industry anymore. We're protecting freedom of press, freedom of speech, we're protecting people's ideas and ideals of a career that they want to, to, to embark on. So what you're doing today starts all of that. Okay, and the work that you're doing in your states and in your communities, critically, critically important. And we're just so thankful that in our Center of Scholastic Journalism that we can help lead that charge as well. So I hope you have a wonderful day today, critically important what you do. And I can't thank enough Mark Goodman, Professor Mark Goodman and Professor Candace Perkins Bowen for all they do as well to lead this. And as Professor John Bowen takes my picture over there, he is already practicing what he preaches. Uh, so, Candace, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Thor. Well, I want to welcome you on behalf of the Center for Scholastic Journalism. And it was kind of interesting last night at dinner, and I'm so glad so many of you could join us for dinner. I wish everybody could have been there. But Wendy Wallace, sitting across the table from me, said, so, what do you hope the outcome to be? And I kind of had a second to pause. It was like, wasn't it just getting you all here? I mean, <laughs> wasn't the whole thing to have this much synergy in the room and, and see what could happen? Now, I know Mark has a better plan than that, but in my mind, some of that has started to happen already in conversations at dinner last night and I think after dinner, and it was, it's just really great to have all of you here. There's one special part of this, this group here that some of you may not realize. The Center for Scholastic Journalism has an advisory board, and it usually meets once a year, and we postponed the meeting for this year until this late so some of our members could be here. And I want you to know that the members that are here from our advisory board are Peter Bobkowski from Kansas, uh, George Daniels from Alabama, Lori Keekley from Minnesota, uh, Mary Stapp from Washington, D.C., and Wendy Wallace from Florida. And I want you to join me in thanking them for joining us here. And the other person I want to introduce is somebody who is such a supporter of ours and so much in our corner. We were very lucky when we got a new dean. Uh, she gets journalism. She gets scholastic media. And she's a wonderful person, and she's going to join us for a while. I want you to help me welcome uh, Dean Amy Reynolds. Thanks. 
Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming and, and joining us today. So um, as Candace said, I'm, I have finished my first year here, so I can't say that I'm new anymore. Uh, I'm starting my second year. But when I was thinking about coming to Kent State, one of the things that drew me here was the Center for Scholastic Journalism and the great work that I know Kent State has done in this area, and also the great work around freedom of expression. Um, my own background, academically, separate from my, my sort of journalism professional side is in First Amendment uh, research. And so I've taught media law for years, and I care very deeply, I think like most of us do, whether it's our primary area of, of focus or not, in First Amendment protections and how we think through um, where we go and how we move forward. And so you know, just last week, I was in New York City at the Practicing Law Institute. They do a communications law in the digital age seminar once a year that is really designed to give continuing law credits for practicing attorneys, but there's a small group of us who are academics who go uh, to just make sure we're staying up on some of the trends that the lawyers are seeing coming down the pike. And it was the day after the election, and there was a lot of gloom and doom. People were sort of trying to be realistic, but also affirmationable about you know, positive things. But you know, if you've been around lawyers, you know that they tend to be pretty straight shooters. And there is a lot of discussion about all the different ways we want to be thinking about potential attacks on the press, whether it's in the area of privilege, whether it's in how the FCC will be reshaped and thinking about net neutrality and where net neutrality goes, um, whether it is in the broader discussions about free speech on college campuses um, as a hot First Amendment topic, whether it's the expansion of corporate speech, and so one of the things that was striking to me as I was sort of listening to the, to the discussions and sort of thinking about how we at Kent State could be playing an important and positive role in these discussions, it kept reminding me how important actions at the state level are and at the local level are. Because if you think about the trends we've seen, because federal gridlock has disabled so much stuff, we know that state legislative efforts, I think, are more important than ever. So I was particularly excited, uh, you know, even last year when Mark started talking about this research for his sabbatical and started thinking about this area. I think this is really important because a lot of these fights are going to happen at the state and local levels. And I think that if we can start to help young people understand not just journalism, but the broader reasons we want to protect press freedoms, I think we're going to ultimately be able to um, have maybe better outcomes in terms of people's broader understanding of the importance of media. We all know that people's uh, opinions of media are maybe not at an all-time low, but if not, they're darn close, right? So, so we know that some of this is partly because I think a lot of people fundamentally don't really understand media. And as technology changes it, that becomes even more complicated. So, so this group and those of us who care about this, I think, are going to play a pivotal role in helping to change this discourse. And it starts with the young people that we work with. So I'm grateful to you all for being here. Uh, I really am grateful to Candace and Mark for all the good work that they always do. But I, I think it's really important that we're taking this step to be thinking through this at a legislative level, at a state level. Um, you know, and, and really highlighting some of the great work that's gone on by, by many of you in this room. Um, and so thank you for your efforts. I appreciate them as someone who values free press and the First Amendment. I think the work that we all do doesn't always get acknowledged in these somewhat um, heated debates about media today. Um, and I want to turn things over now to uh, Professor Mark Goodman, our uh, Knight Chair in Scholastic Journalism and a, a longtime leader in this area. So thank you, Mark. Thank you, Amy. I've already lost my binder, and we haven't even begun. We're going to edit this out. So. <laughs> First of all, thank you all. Thank you all for being here. We're really pleased to have you be a part of our program, and I want to thank. Um, the, the video viewing audience. We are recording the entire day today, and we will soon, we hope, make this available on the Center for Classic Journalism website so people who weren't able to be in attendance can learn from what you have to say. You know, as many of you know, the first um, conversation about student free press legislation like this that we hosted at Kent State was in 2008, just again, days after the election. 
a very different time in our nation's history, perhaps. Um, but one way in which it was different was sort of the optimism we had about the future of scholastic journalism um, protecting legislation. We believed after the <coughs> activism of young people um, in that election in 2008 um, and the fact that some state legislatures had shifted um, to more democratic control and Democrats had historically been more supportive of this kind of legislation, we were extremely optimistic of the success of these efforts. <coughs> what happened? Absolutely nothing until 2015 and the miraculous folks from North Dakota, who we'll hear more about in a minute. But um, the sad reality is, is that our optimism and outward appearances looking to be more in our favor didn't translate to successful legislative efforts. Not that people didn't try and work really hard, it just didn't happen. Um, what I think that the message that sends is we should not be in any way discouraged by uh, out of a fear that we cannot be successful in a climate where the media is under fire. Because as we've seen um, in the last two years especially, we've definitely um, made some progress. Before I turn it over to our first panelist, I, I, I promised that I would give a little background, which the audience in this room probably doesn't need, but the audience out of this room may um, be uh, um, in, in use of. You know, I, I always tell people the, the start of so much of what we talk about began with the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Tinkered versus Des Moines. The Supreme Court's recognition for the first time clearly and directly that high school students and, and junior high school students for that matter don't shed their free expression rights at the schoolhouse gate. When John and Mary Beth Tinker and their friend Chris Eckert were punished for wearing black armbands in protest of U.S. involvement in the conflict in Vietnam, and the Supreme Court upheld their right to wear those armbands, rejected the school's punishment as a violation of their First Amendment protections. Um, the stage was set for the environment we're in today. This Tinker decision, as you all know, said that only when school officials could show material and substantial disruption of school activities or invasion of the rights of others would, school, would the administrators legally be allowed to censor. Well, Tinker was the starting point. Unfortunately, it led to, as you well know, the 1988 Hazelwood versus Kohlmeyer decision, the first case involving scholastic journalism to reach the Supreme Court, and unfortunately one where the Supreme Court cut back on those strong First Amendment protections that had been recognized in um, Tinker. Um, in this case, the Supreme Court said that unless a student publication was operating as a public forum, a designated public forum, school officials would have greater, not unlimited, but greater authority to control and censor. And as the Student Press Law Center saw in the years immediately after, the amount of censorship of high school media increased significantly. I vividly remember talking to advisors in those first few years after the Hazelwood ruling who said they had been working um, in the school advising student media for a decade or two, um, some cases even more, and had never experienced the problems they began to see after the Supreme Court's Hazelwood decision began to trickle down into their school environment. So, the need for some remedy for that um, uh, frustrating decision curtailing students' rights. I, I wanted to mention, since he was a member of our um, Center for Classic Journalism as advisory board, and since he, he passed away only this year, our dear friend Nick Ferentinos was in many ways uh, uh, the person who's responsible for starting the fire that lit this legislative effort. Nick Ferentinos was for many years, you will know, the advisor of the Epitaph, the student newspaper at Homestead High School in Cupertino, California. Um, on the day the Hazelwood was decision was decided, Nick's students were censored when they tried to publish this story about AIDS. A student in their school who had, was HIV positive, who they were relaying um, his concerns that his peers were not taking it seriously enough. Um, um, 
the, the school administrator was concerned about the story, knew before the Hazelwood ruling that he couldn't censor it um, under Tinker. He couldn't show substantial disruption or invasion of any other's rights. Um, but once the Hazelwood ruling came down, he told the students and the, their advisor, Nick, that they were not going to be allowed to run that story. Well, um, as Nick related to me many times and many others of us over the years, um, he got a call from a reporter for the San Jose Mercury News on the day of the Supreme Court ruling saying, well, I'm trying to localize this Supreme Court case, and I'm wondering how you think it might affect you and your school. Um, and Nick was able to say, not only will it, it already has. And what that resulted in was the recognition that California had a law on the books since the early 1970s that basically codified the Tinker Standard into state statute, a law that had largely been ignored by scholastic journalism folks, myself included, um, up until that point. You know, the fascinating thing about this case is that it, um, or excuse me, the statute, it resulted from a statute that existed even before that time in California that prohibited propaganda publications in the school, and after Tinker someone contested those state statutes that limited so-called propaganda publications in the school, and the court in California found them unconstitutional. So this legislature had to repeal that law and replace it with what we know today as California Education Code, um, Section 48907. So California became the first, but what it did was illustrate that there is a way around the Hazelwood limitations. Um, and in fact, the California Commissioner of Education made that point clearly. Um, public school students still enjoy, California public school students still enjoy substantial freedom of the press despite um, the recent Supreme Court decision. Um, we began calling um, um, California a Hazelwood free zone. Um, and um, began thinking about how other states could do the same thing. Well, as we all know, and what we're going to focus on today is the states that have been successful and how to make the states that haven't been up to that point. You see the long list. There were some dry years, especially from 2007 to 2015, um, from 1994 to 2007. Um, but we're on a roll. Um, North Dakota, Maryland, Illinois, within the last 18 months have uh, had success and have really um, inspired us all, um, I think. Each of these statutes, in their own unique way, attempted to codify the Tinker Standard as the uh, context in which school officials legally could censor. Um, 23 states, though, have tried unsuccessfully to get these laws passed. 23 states. And um, what we want to do is discuss what might be possible to make those states um, added to the list of states with student free press law.